Welcome to New Mandela TV. I'm James Higaha, Asia Pacific Editor at the College of Asia and the Pacific at ANU. Today I'm joined by Associate Professor Greg Feely from the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs to talk about Indonesian politics and Jokowi. Greg, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure, James. If we could turn to the current situation that Jokowi finds himself in, were we wrong in having so much hope for Jokowi as Indonesia's newest president and the possibility of reform that he seemed to bring with his election? Clearly we were. Uh, I think nearly all observers overestimated Jokowi's capacity to bring about change. And it's been, in fact, quite shocking at several critical points to see his inability to resist pressure, mainly from major coalition partners, but also from other significant um, uh, interest groups within Indonesian society and the political elite. And we expected, and indeed he steadfastly spoke about his desire to overcome those kinds of vested interests and to create a completely different kind of Indonesia, one that would be clean, one that would be based on reform and merit and the like. And within a few days of his presidency with the announcement of the cabinet, it was clear that he had in effect buckled to pressure and had embarked on a course that entailed a lot of compromises that we never expected he would do. I would mention that this was not a surprise only to uh, foreign observers, but also many people who worked very closely with him, including in his own team, his election um, success team, have also been surprised at the way that Jokowi has reacted to the pressures of being president. So we didn't have many indications in his earlier career as mayor of Solo and then as governor of Jakarta that he would lack steadfastness in the way he has done as president. And I suppose one conclusion to draw from this is that it's almost like a political Peter principle that a person rises to a level where they fail. And the harsh reality may be that Jokowi is not equipped to be a good president, the good leader of a nation, whereas he was an effective governor and a very effective mayor. I wouldn't want to judge this too early, but we have to be open to the possibility that, in fact, being a president of Indonesia with all the huge responsibilities and pressures that involves is something that he, in fact, doesn't respond to um, very effectively. So do you think Jokowi, particularly with the current situation between the Police uh, Anti-Corruption Commission and the National Police, KPK and Polri, can he dig himself out of these holes? He just seems to be creating more and more problems for himself, particularly with the appointment of people who, while slightly better than previous appointments, aren't that much better. Can he come back from this? This is one of several cases where a bad, a really bad initial decision has all kinds of knock-on effects and Jokowi is working hard to try to lessen those, those deleterious effects and it's proving a battle and he seems to be winning some victories. So you mentioned his previous nominee for the uh, police, National Police Chief position, Budi Gunawan. So his nomination has now been cancelled after the um, Anti-Corruption Commission was going to charge him with corruption. Uh, he has been replaced with Badrodin Haiti, who is somewhat better, but still not really a reform-minded, clean chief of police. Uh, indeed, it's very hard to find completely clean, um, highly effective um, police generals. Uh, but it's an improvement on Budi Gunawan. But some of the protégés of Budi Gunawan who are conducting a relentless campaign against the leadership of the Anti-Corruption Commission remain in place. The head of the National Detective um, Division is one of those people who remains in place, Budi Waseso. So as long as some of those people remain in place, harm continues to be done. Uh, Jokowi, in the same, uh, at the same time, has appointed three new commissioners um, to the temporary commissioners to the Anti-Corruption Commission. Um, 
One of those has a charge against him. Uh, the police are pursuing a charge against him. Uh, another of those appointees is someone who seems to have close links to the Suharto era elite and uh, there are questions about uh, his integrity to be working in such a sensitive position. So again, a lot of Jokowi's positions, a lot of the decisions that he's taking are containing compromises that are not really in step with his avowed aim of cleaning up Indonesian politics. And what's more, if he doesn't take really strong action against what the police is doing, the result will be a nobbled, will be a greatly less effective um, anti-corruption commission. And this is crucial for Jokowi. The anti-corruption commission is probably the most important institution to cleaning up Indonesian politics or to retaining some kind of cleanliness in Indonesian politics. So if he allows that to be emasculated, um, well then that will be a very big black mark against his name. Are we being unfair to Jokowi? Can Indonesian politics truly be clean as they currently stand? What hope is there, particularly with the, the perpetuation of oligarchs within the system itself? Indeed, it's a massive, it's a massive task. And I think everyone expected that he would have to make compromises, that there would be some cabinet ministers who were not to his liking, but they were the price he had to pay for keeping coalition partners happy. But I think it's the extent of the compromises and the kind of uh, either regressive or low competence ministers who have been appointed, that's been the surprise. We would have thought there would be 20-30% of ministers like that, and instead I think the percentage is higher. And some of the appointments are in uh, key portfolios, such as the Defence Minister, and uh, this is a, a very important portfolio for Jokowi, and, um, uh, and we, many of us feel as if he didn't have to make that appointment. There are other options open to him. So, yes, compromise is certainly necessary. You can't take on all of the vested interests in Indonesian politics in one go. But I certainly expected him to confront them in a more systematic way than what he's done. And in fact, before he was inaugurated as president, he sent out some of his most trusted um, advisers to tell people in key parts of the elite that things were going to change, that the kind of cartel arrangements that they had or the kinds of uh, political chicanery they have gotten up to would no longer be tolerated. And so it looked as if he was putting in place a system of measures that would really strike a blow against old-style Indonesian politics. And when it came to the crunch, he did hardly any of those things. There are a few areas, um, oil and gas was one area he attempted to clean up. Um, a few other, there are a number of good appointments in the cabinet, but nowhere near enough to make the kind of difference that he talked about. So um, the job is not impossible to bring about reform. It just requires a good deal of fortitude and I think political savviness. And What's disappointed me is that Jokowi has shown far too little of either of those qualities. For a man who's had the kind of meteoric rise that he's had, he's taken a lot of risks, he's been very clever in the way he's navigated his way through various competing forces, but we're not finding that now that he's in the presidential palace. And speaking of compromise, Greg, Arjakoi's actions also a testament to his ability or inability to manage that relationship with Megawati Sukarnaputri and the PDIP, or is it something else in your mind? It's, it's more than just Megawati and PDIP, although that remains perhaps one of the most, or the most significant problem for him inside his own coalition. Um, he has another big problem in the form of Surya Palo, who is the basically the boss of the National Democratic Party and Surya Palo is a very big businessman and he has also pushed Jokowi into making a number of appointments which were really not at all reform, inimical to reform process. So they're really the two groups of people who have caused Jokowi most problems as president. I suppose and it's hard for us to know enough about what's been going on behind the scenes, particularly what's been going on in the palace to know for sure. 
but there's a clear impression that uh, he hasn't been willing to um, to push things to the brink. So, for example, when the cabinet was being put together, and Megawati was insisting on certain of her people being appointed, and people to whom Jokowi clearly objected, rather than Jokowi saying no, he continued to visit Megawati's house. Um, he continued to you know, seek out advice about what she was thinking about these issues, but he was the president. The game should have changed at that point. And indeed, he spoke to people before he was inaugurated, and he said, the game will change at that point. When I have all the authority of the president, I will assert myself. And in fact, he didn't. He looked subordinate, he looked compliant. And I think that sent out messages to a lot of people in the political system that if you apply enough pressure, you'll be able to, at the very least, get to get Jokowi to compromise a great deal, and you might be able to get him to back down entirely on his preferred choices. And so that's the process that seems to me to have been in play with people like Megawati and also Surya Palo. Now you alluded to this earlier, Greg, um, a lot of Jokowi's compromises seem to speak against his notion of reform and his promise of reform, but also if we turn now to the case of the Bali Nine and the two Australians on death row, uh, his decision not to grant clemency and go ahead with these executions as a matter of policy um, seemed to really speak against Jokowi's socially progressive promise and nature. What do you make of this decision to not even countenance clemency under any circumstances? I think there's several possible interpretations and some of it comes back to Jokowi's own personality and indeed it's becoming increasingly clear how little we do know about what he really thinks. He gives very little of himself away in any of his public statements. Um, there, there tend to be very anodyne things about his past, but as to his current thinking, his face has hardly any expression on it. Whenever he gives interviews, and particularly when he's talking about important things. So Yudhoyono, for example, if he was making a statement about something he felt strongly about, you would often see the emotion on his face. It was clear that this was something that meant a lot to him. But Jokowi looks much more impassive, so he's a difficult man to read and it's hard to know whether he's experiencing any kind of inner turmoil about a decision such as executing a dozen people or more. Um, having said that, I think it's also revealing about the politics. So Jokowi made this decision in the first month of his presidency. I think there's probably a lot of truth to what the Fairfax media has been reporting that Jokowi didn't have anywhere near enough information in which to make these decisions at the time in which he made it, this blanket um, rejection of all clemency pleas. And uh, he made that decision seemingly to look tough. You know, lots of observers have commented on this at a time when he was already being criticised. I think his refusal to budge from that position is indicative of perhaps uh, a more socially conservative attitude than we had imagined that he had. And so he may well indeed, as a matter of principle, find nothing to object to in the death penalty. I think there's a certain lack of intellectual engagement or philosophical engagement, perhaps even moral engagement with this issue as well. So there's a plenty of information available that the figures that Jokowi is quoting for the death toll rising from hard drugs and for the number of Indonesians who are addicted to hard drugs is probably greatly inflated. They're certainly not reliable figures to be quoting day in, day out. Nonetheless, Jokowi continues to do so. He also hasn't in any way engaged with the debate about the effectiveness of the death penalty as a deterrent. And so the whole question of the efficacy of state execution of people and if they execute the next batch of 12 or so well that'll bring to 18 people in a few months who, whose lives he has taken away in effect and he doesn't give any impression of being um, perturbed about that uh, or of going through an internal debate about whether this is justified and he could easily leave those people in jail because most of them, if their sentences are commuted, they've got life sentences. 
Um, he could also stall the process. Many Indonesian presidents have done that. He didn't have to bring matters to the head in the way he's done, but he has done so. And I think it's not only for political reasons, but I think he himself believes that he should just act on this matter. So we're learning things about Jokowi as a result of this, of this process. And um, for people who have a more progressive set of views, uh, they're not particularly pleasant things. Is there any chance that he will do a U-turn and change his decision? There's been a lot of agitation from Australia, particularly our Foreign Minister and Prime Minister, which undoubtedly is probably not helpful in the way it's been framed. But is there any chance that Jokowi might reverse his decision in this case? I'm sorry to say I see almost zero prospect of him changing his attitude. Uh, partly because he has already made an emphatic public commitment to continue with the executions. He must be mindful of the kind of political flack that Yudhoyono copped when he um, showed leniency towards Chappelle, Chappelle Corby. So there's no votes for an Indonesian president to be seen to be soft on drug dealers and there's probably a great deal of political harm. But moreover, I think Jokowi, he's not much concerned about what other countries think, and particularly Western countries. Um, and that's also completely different from Yudi Yono, who was always preoccupied with Indonesia's international standing. So the kind of reputational harm that Indonesia has been suffering over these, and it's not just in Australia, it's in Brazil and the Netherlands and lots of other countries, and this will continue if he proceeds with the executions. I don't think that particularly worries Jokowi at all. He's a very domestically focused politician. He knows very little about international affairs, aside from some economic issues. And the whole business of diplomacy is something that's rather abstract to him. Uh, and I also think it does come back to the point that he probably doesn't see the death penalty as a bad thing. And he may well have what I take to be a rather simplistic view that the death penalty will indeed help to curb drugs. Now, I think if he really wanted to solve the problem of hard drug distribution in Indonesia, he would look at his own police force. There have been a number of police generals and other senior officers who've been charged and convicted for their involvement in drug business. There's a lot of media and, and other reporting and academic studies to show the heavy involvement in police in the drug, drug industry, but he's not touching that. He's taking the easy option. So that is also somewhat contrary. No one expected he would confront the police and seek overnight um, change and withdrawal from these things. But what he could do is more purposefully support the measures that would gradually put very high disincentives on police officers being come, becoming involved in not only drug trade but other forms of corruption by empowering, you know, anti-corruption commission, all sorts of other investigative agencies who might be looking at this. And um, that's what he's not doing. And so the core problem uh, remains, I think, and killing foreigners who've been running drugs um, uh, is not really going to have much impact on it at all. And finally, Greg, if we take the whole picture of the disillusionment both within the Indonesian electorate and possibly the international perspective on Jokowi, what would his main political rival, Prabowo, be making of all this? You ran him so close in the 2014 presidential elections. Do you think Prabowo would be getting itching feet and tempted to jump back on the horse, so to speak, and make another tilt? Uh, I think Prabowo would always hold out the hope that uh, he could become president one day. But he's been playing a curious role. Um, it was, he met Jokowi, uh, when was it, a week or the week before? And uh, he spoke in a mildly supportive way of what Jokowi was planning to do to kind of get out of this mess in regarding the nomination of the National Police Chief. And Prabowo's coalition in Parliament has actually played ball. It's actually passed some of the legislation that Jokowi wants through. So it hasn't been implacable opposition from Prabowo. He could have done a lot more to destabilise Jokowi, to make life difficult for him than what he's been doing. So it's a very interesting role that he's playing in that. Now, part of that 
is also to deepen the divide between Megawati and Jokowi. Um, so there's some payback for Prabowo in that because he's never quite forgiven Megawati for uh, well, not endorsing him in his last presidential campaign. Um, but he's playing a more complicated role than what many of us thought that he would play. So he also hasn't been acting according to script. Thanks, Greg. Pleasure.